Thank you, Warren. Good morning, everybody. We're in uh, John, let's try Luke. Let's do Luke. <laughs> Luke chapter 9. I guess you, if, if I did look John, it would be ambidextrous. Would that be the... I always enjoy uh, Warren's opening prayer. He always starts with something about uh, what a privilege it is, what a joy it is to come together and study God's Word. And that always gets me on the, going on the right uh, foot because I think, yes, it absolutely is. And I know everybody here uh, feels the same way. Uh, it's, it's a privilege to get to come and be with you, no matter if who's here uh, or there, uh, and, and hear the Word of God proclaimed. So we're going to do that today. We've come to one of the key passages in the Gospel of Luke. I hope I don't say that every uh, lesson, but it is one of the key uh, passages. If you think back to the opening verses of chapter 1, uh, Luke explained his purpose to the most excellent Theophilus, you know, and uh, uh, it was that he might uh, compile an account of the things accomplished among us so that Theophilus might know the exact truth about the things he had been taught. Well, part of that truth was, and Warren made reference to this, part of that truth was the curiosity of Herod the Tetrarch concerning Jesus as he went about his Galilean uh, ministry, creating this sensation with his teaching, with his miraculous works. And Herod wondered, who is this man about whom I hear such things? Well, in Luke's narration, that was followed immediate, immediately by at least a partial answer to that question in the feeding of the 5,000 about which we read and studied a couple of weeks ago. And now in the passage before us this morning, we have what we might rightly label the great reveal. In fact, I thought about titling the lesson, the great reveal. Will Farago, if you're listening, you can change it to the great uh, reveal. Uh, but Peter's confession of Jesus as the Christ of God. The disciples had seen enough uh, by this time to at least begin to understand that Jesus was more than a man. Uh, no mere man could miraculously feed the thousands of people in the manner that he had uh, or raise up a man's dead daughter to live again. They thought of him surely now as the Lord of creation, the Lord of life. And the verses we're about to read will explain why we are all here this morning, like the disciples. We are Christ's followers. At the same time, uh, the verses bring upon us a comprehensive and enduring responsibility. In the light of the revelation Jesus will make, uh, those who would be his true followers are starkly differentiated from those who will prove to be mere pretenders. Uh, pretenders who at one time perhaps entertained a kind of dalliance with the idea of identifying with the Christ, but the cost of it, in their minds at least, proved too dear. Because Jesus will demand a denial of self and the necessity of choosing a path that will at times be painful and involve sacrifice, but it is the path that Christ himself chose. I've, I've mentioned this little quip before, but I always remember this colorful description that a simple a country real estate developer from Georgia uh, gave to me concerning his own decision to follow after Christ. He said, I went down to the dock to get on a cruise ship only to discover it was a battleship. I think you can relate to that sometimes. 
where we're going to read now verses 18 through 27. There's a lot here, so let's get going. It happened that while he was praying alone, the disciples were with him, and he questioned them, saying, who do the people say that I am? You'll note there literally the crowds. Who do the crowds say that I am? They answered and said, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, but others that one of the prophets of old has risen again. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered and said, the Christ of God. But he warned them and instructed them not to tell this to anyone, saying, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. And he was saying to them all, so you notice a little shift here. He's alone, then his disciples join him, and now all. The, the crowds, he's, he's called them together. We know that from the Gospel of Mark. So he was saying to them all, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. For what is a man profited if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory, in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. But I say to you truthfully, there are some of those standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. Well, Luke, uh, gives us at the beginning of this section a little indication uh, where this uh, pivotal discussion with his disciples took place. But Matthew and Mark do. It was in the vicinity of Caesarea Philippi, a predominantly Gentile region far removed from, the, from Galilee with its uh, bustling uh, and crowded Jewish people, uh, further still from Judea and Jerusalem uh, with its temple and the by now contaminated cabal of Jewish leaders who were beginning to scheme to bring about his demise. The shadow of their rejection had already begun to fall upon Jesus and so he had led the twelve away from them to a place where seclusion could be had. It was, it was quite purposeful. And Luke has his own way of indicating that. Of all the gospel writers, uh, Luke is the one who makes special note of Jesus praying. Uh, and at times, often associated with significant moments in his ministry. He was praying at his baptism when the heavenly voice uh, came out of heaven. Uh, praying before he chose the 12 uh, disciples. Uh, immediately before his transfiguration uh, in verse 28 of, of this chapter, and of course, memorably, at Gethsemane. He was praying. Here, uh, the moment was to be a fateful one, and he describes the Lord as praying alone beforehand, and then apparently calling his disciples along beside him, where he began to ask them some questions. The first regarded the people, the crowds who had recently been uh, pursuing him. Who, who did the crowds say that I am? But it was not curiosity about the crowds really that led to his question as if he truly did not know what they thought or what they were saying. This was the setup to the question that would follow and was far more important to him. Uh, the people, uh, well, they thought he was a miracle worker and, and a very good person. That's what they thought about Jesus. He was a wonder to them, and the disciples had observed it and heard their groundless speculations. John the Baptist, perhaps, or, or one of John's uh, disciples. Others said Elijah, uh, maybe one of the old 
prophets who had come back to life. Uh, there wasn't any evidence that, that they had any idea who he really was. And in a way, if you think about it, their opinions of him were insulting uh, when measured against uh, the reality. But the Lord listened to their replies patiently. I say that. I can picture him uh, doing that. And then he leveled the question that would force the disciples to verbalize the faith that had been building over time. It was their opinion that he was concerned with. And so he asked them, but who do you say that I am? And that you uh, in, in the sentence is, is em emphatic. Uh, we, we could translate it, but you, who do you say that I am? It's not the opinions of people that are important for any one individual. For the knowledge of Christ must always be a personal experience. Like death, which we must all experience alone. So our profession of who we believe Jesus truly is must be one to one. Uh, expressed out of the depths of our own souls and without care for what others may say or think. But in this group of 12, of course, we know Peter uh, tended to be the spokesman for them, and so he answered for them all, the Christ of God. That's the abbreviated form of the answer he gave. It's the one that Luke records, uh, Christ or Christos is the Greek word uh, that translates the Hebrew word for Messiah, which literally means the anointed one. It's likely more than a few of you are repeating silently to yourself the longer version of Peter's response found in Matthew 16, where Peter replies, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Uh, that one is the more expansive, perhaps, uh, than the other. For to say that Jesus is the Son of the living God is almost tantamount to saying He is the Christ. But it's a marvelous uh, confession. Let's take it for what it is, a marvelous a confession, and the Lord indicated that in his response in Matthew by turning to Peter and say, bl saying, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. The Apostle Paul uh, would later write in Romans 10, verse 10, with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth, he confesses, resulting in salvation. But both the believing and the confessing are the result of the necessary supernatural revelation of God enabling it all. It's the work of God the Father's sovereignly dispensing the grace of belief via the enablement of His Spirit. Their faith we know this was as yet incomplete. That becomes apparent immediately, and it would not come into full bloom until after the resurrection, but it was a growing uh, faith. Uh, we've all experienced that in our own lives, a growing faith. Thank you, Lord, for increasing our faith. But previously, uh, as you can read in the sixth chapter of John's Gospel, there, John, he records the feeding of the 5,000 as well, but then he uh, also includes this very difficult teaching in John chapter 6 that caused some of the people who had been following him to withdraw and say, not, not, not for me. But Peter, uh, Peter again, had confessed there, you have words of eternal life. We have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. And so here now, his faith is enlarged such that it encompasses Jesus as the promised Messiah, though the scope of understanding of that was limited. It was a growing faith. Someone has said that uh, this was the first real confession of the church 
and in being so, it establishes the content and framework of the essential confession every true believer must make. Who do you say Jesus is? What a person believes about Jesus of Nazareth is everything. It's the only thing in, in one sense, but it's, it's, it's everything. That's a profound thought in this world of eight billion people. Eight billion people, I looked it up, I didn't trust myself. Uh, we're up to almost eight billion people. The eternal destiny of every single one will be determined by the answer they give to the question Jesus asked his disciples at Caesarea Philippi. None of us do enough to spread that word around to provide the answer that leads to salvation, but each of us can find our own unique uh, way of proclaiming it. It brings glory to God for us to do it, and it brings a glorious future to miserable sinners like we ourselves are, and I can tell you I'm glad someone uh, told me about it. Well, the Lord had clearly encouraged Peter and the others' confession this day. And that's why Jesus' further response in verse 21 now may initially seem surprising. He warned them and instructed them not to tell anyone. Uh, the force of uh, the admonition was firm and, and an element of command underlying his charge. At, at this point, such knowledge in the possession of the multitudes already impassioned by Jesus' presence could easily have incited in them a political uprising reflecting the popular belief that Messiah's coming would bring about a deliverance from the yoke of Roman rule. But Jesus had a mission to accomplish and, and timing was critical to it. His familiar and regular protest, my hour had not yet come, uh, underscored that. As did his even more surprising statement that follows in verse 22, Peter's confession imposed on the Lord, so to speak, the need to elucidate in what way he intended to fu fulfill the designation of the Christ of God. It was something of a bombshell statement in the ears of the disciples, but also in a sense, his own answer to the question, who do you say that I am? He said, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. In other words, this is who I am, the suffering servant uh, predicted from of old, the Christ in full garb. The first part of the unfolding of who he was is to be found in the title he chose for himself. He was the son of man. That was his favorite phrase of self-description borrowed from uh, Daniel's uh, prophecies of the triumphant Messiah that designated him as the Son of Man and expressing perhaps more adequately the mode of his triumph. It would be his, through his becoming a man. He was the Son of Man. But if triumphant, then the language he used of him was startling for it was not seemingly the language of the victor. Uh, rather, it pointed to the necessity <clears throat> of suffering and rejection and death. He must uh, suffer all these things. Uh, this is what being Messiah was to mean, these things. But where had that idea come from? Well, in Jesus' eyes, uh, plainly we know from the scriptures, which uh, foretold such suffering for anyone who had eyes to see. But the misinterpretations of the Jews over the centuries had continually misconstrued those scriptures so that they lost all their true meaning. And yet ultimately, the concept originated out of the divine purpose that had decreed this to be the aim of Messiah's mission. Suffering was to be for Messiah, 
no accident, but a compelling divine necessity. He, look, he employs four verbs in succession to express the way of the Son of Man, that he must suffer, he must be rejected, he must be killed, and he must be raised. Four phrases, four descriptions of what must happen with Messiah. And the first <clears throat> is a broad description of what his experience was to be. He was to suffer uh, many things. <clears throat> One need only go to a single passage in the Old Testament to find uh, that, uh, that prophecy, though, though there are many, uh, but the suffering servant song of Isaiah 52, 13 through 53, uh, 12. Uh, that, that, that song uh, is immersed in the language of sacrifice and sorrow, uh, despised and forsaken by men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. He was crushed, he was pierced, he was scourged. He was like a lamb led uh, to slaughter. At the end of Luke's gospel, I'm going to refer to a, a scene that you all know very well, but there at the end, uh, Luke describes that, that poignant meeting between the risen uh, but unrecognizable Christ and two of his disciples on the road to Emmaus, Luke 24. They were uh, deeply discouraged over the report of Jesus' crucifixion, but Jesus challenged them asking, was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? And then Luke states, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. So suffering was integral to his identity. The second thing that was necessary for him to undergo was to be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes. Those three groups uh, combined uh, formed the ruling council known as the Sanhedrin. And of course, the Gospels uh, bear witness repeatedly to the fulfillment of this throughout his ministry. Jesus was a, a threat to uh, their position, their status, and they hated him. They hated Jesus, uh, that they rejected him. That This word uh, reflects the use of a Greek verb that would indicate a kind of legal examination after which, this, after which examination they ruled against him. The word was used of the examining of coins to discern whether or not they, they were counterfeit. And, these leaders would show themselves not to be interested, though, in a, really a true evaluation, a true examination. Thirdly, uh, the way of the Christ was that he must be killed. Under Roman rule, that could only mean the cross. You're going to be killed. Uh, it would be a cross. The disciples would have been stunned to hear that. They had already seen him suffer uh, in some degree, and they had felt the venom of uh, the Jewish leaders, but this they could not have fathomed. McLaren said they had fancied a throne, the vision melted into a cross. And then lastly, if really, if the disciples were even able to comprehend anything else that he said, uh, the Messiah must be raised up on the third day must be raised up on the third day. Now the tense and the passive uh, voice uh, of the envisioned raising would have indicated that it would be God who would uh, raise him. Again, if they were, were still listening and, and were able to hear and comprehend that good news. But in the structure of this declaration, with one clause following after the other in order, he must, he must, he must, he must. The idea is that his resurrection was to be as certain as his crucifixion. Later, the church uh, would recognize that, just like we do today. Uh, the author of Hebrews would write in Hebrews 2, verse 10, of how we do see him who was made for a little while lower than the angels, namely Jesus, because of the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor. 
what Jesus was communicating to the 12 was nothing less than the structure of the gospel that ultimate would, ultimately would be their life's obsession, that God had sent his son into the world to, to die. Uh, the experience he was to undergo uh, might be a surprise to the disciples, but it would be no surprise to him. When he came down uh, from glory, emptying himself by taking on a human nature with all its frailties, he knew what was going to take place. He knew he must uh, die, for he had made that promise. And his father was complicit. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all. So it's the gospel. There's the gospel. He presented to these 12, 11 of whom would be the ambassadors of that message. And now we come to the great challenge the Lord lays out for those who would follow after the Christ. Uh, Jesus Christ suffered and died alone. He himself bore the penalty for sin alone. He cried out on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But according to scripture, it's equally true that his followers are partakers in his suffering. And that's the substance of the remaining uh, verses, verses 23 through 26, in which Jesus shifts to what their experience is to be. Luke introduces his readers to the subject in verse 23 by indicating the new audience he was saying to them all. Uh, Mark 8:34 clarifies what that means. The setting had somehow shifted and Jesus had called to himself the multitude. Here was the larger crowd, the, the mix of true followers and the curious and they must all hear, they must all hear what will be the consequences for the lives of any who would choose to follow after the suffering Son of Man. And that would include down through the ages. That would include our call uh, to follow him. And he was saying to them all, this is verse 23, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. And I think it's important uh, at the beginning uh, to say that this is hard. It, it, it's, it's, it's a difficult thing to define what this means, but it's hard. It, it's hard to deny oneself, uh, hard to contemplate uh, making one's way along the path that a cross bearer must uh, take to be willing to give up one's own life in order to follow in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. It was hard for him uh, to bear the cross in his humanity. It was hard to feel his brother's scorn. It was hard to go forward to agony, sweating drops of blood when the desire for an easier way tempted him. Uh, hard to see his friends abandon him. Hard to bear the pain. Hard to feel the abandonment of his father. But what Jesus is now describing here is the Christian life. And I don't think it's a reckless leap to say that to the extent we do not experience this hard road, that is probably the extent to which we often prefer an escape down a different road. I know that to be true in my life. The first thing a person must do who would come after Jesus is deny himself. That means the, the, the believer must not put himself in the first uh, position. He, he or she cannot be self-centered. Uh, and that's hard because as I often say, we are self-ish people. <laughs> 
We wake up in the morning thinking about ourselves or go to bed at night thinking about ourselves. And throughout the day, that's pretty much what dominates our thoughts and motivations. But the Christian must be willing to say with the apostle in Philippians 3, whatever things were gained to me, those things I've counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Secondly, a Christ follower must take up his cross daily. You might be surprised to know that this is the first time that Luke has uh, brought in the word cross into his gospel. And in the context, it's, it's fitting uh, because crucifixion was a common fate. It was uh, not that uncommon a thing for one living under Roman rule to see a man carrying his cross in the company of some Roman soldiers. Everyone would know where he was headed. Leon Morris wrote in his commentary that they knew they were on a one-way journey and would not be back. So taking up the cross signified the ultimate in self-denial, a willingness to die for him if, if called to. Jesus will say in chapter 14, verse 27, <clears throat> whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. He wasn't speaking of uh, the afflictions and difficulties of life that all of us uh, endure that are the burden of every single one of us, not illness, not financial uh, setbacks, not the loss of loved ones, not loneliness, unless uh, these confront us on account of our faithfulness in following after uh, the Christ of, of God. But if we lose our job because we're following in the steps of Jesus, if we're lonely uh, because we will not compromise in our Christian conduct, if we're shunned and slandered because our testimony has made us enemies, then we've taken up our cross. We have taken up our, our cross. And the Lord says it is to be the bend of our lives. We are to take up our cross daily. It's not one and done, but our daily practice. Uh, Paul gives us, Paul, the apostle, gives us a good example. He said, I die daily, every day. <clears throat> and finally, Jesus says, and, and really, uh, in summary, he must follow me. The gist of it is that the disciple who takes up his cross daily is doing what Jesus does. He's following in the steps of his master. Peter was listening this, this day. We know that because he wrote the same thing in 1 Peter 2, 21. You've been called for this purpose since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. Well, in the final three verses, verses 24 through 26, I know we actually read through verse 27, and I'll have a brief uh, word about that. But in, in these three verses, the Lord urges something like common sense. I like common sense. I don't always follow it, but I sure like it. Uh, one writer labeled the verses the logic of the cross because they bring into focus the contrast between the great loss that will be incurred by those who refuse the sacrifice involved in following after Christ on the one hand, and the enormous reward awaiting those who take up their crosses on the other hand. And you'll notice as you scan the verses, each begins with that little preposition for, we should pay attention to these little things, we, the Greek students love that gar, don't they? Uh, just, but look, uh, verses 24 through uh, 26. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. For what is a man profited if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father, Father and the holy uh, angels. Here are compelling reasons for heeding 
the Lord's recommendation. It is because of these three deadly serious realities that those who were listening this day ought to choose what might seem to be the more difficult path and, and also why people of every generation ought to heed his words. First, in verse 24, two types of people are contrasted. Uh, we should examine them and decide uh, which we are. The comparison is filled with irony. On one side is the person who loves this life so much, or at least he imagines, uh, what he, it's what he imagines is everything that could be good in this life, that he is unwilling to make such sacrifice as Jesus s suggests. But the truth, the sad truth, is that attitude is the path going the other direction. Because of his attitude, he's going to lose his life one day, not save it. It may seem far off in the future. It always does, right? It may seem far off in the future and not even real, but it's all too true. One's reminded of the rich fool that Luke will uh, tell us about in, in his 12th chapter. He clings to his life as if it's the ultimate reality and the ultimate source of pleasure. He'll, he'll build bigger barns to, uh, to keep it all. Bigger barns. But sadly, his so-called good life is like the sand in the hourglass. It's seeping down You've seen it. It's seeping down to nothing, and too soon he'll go down to the bottom with it. On the other side is one of whom the Lord has described. He is prepared to lose his life in the anticipation that by doing so, he will paradoxically save it. His perspective is different. He, he, he knows that this is not all that there is, but there is an abundant life, not visible in this short sojourn, and he'll soon inherit it and find it to be immeasurably greater than the trinkets and charms in this world. Jim Elliott was the young missionary to the Hawarani Indians of Ecuador, and he lost his life bringing the gospel to them. I think all of you know who Jim Elliott uh, is. He was speared to death by the very people he was trying to bring the gospel to on the beach there in Ecuador. Uh, he had this attitude of famously declaring, and I do mean famously, he is no fool who gives what he cannot lose, what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Now look at verse 25 because it's like that and really carries the same thought as verse 24. What profit is there for a person who imagines he's gained the whole world? But in his striving, he loses what's most important, his own soul. That is the true, that's this word, the, the, the true essence of who or what he is. It, it's the height of folly, uh, the truth of it documented in countless poems and songs. All that glitters is not gold. It's not gold. Finally, in verse 26, the futile recklessness of the life lived only for the here and now is presented in its most intense form as the Lord juxtaposes it against one's eternal destiny. Here's the final warning put in the most personal Forms. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. To be ashamed of Jesus now uh, will be to come to an inglorious uh, future in the end. It will be a terrible fate for a person to find the Son of Man clothed in glory, ashamed of him, ashamed of, of her. Jesus often spoke of glory. It's as if glory was always on his mind. That's because, of course, he knew glory as none of us do. And significantly, the closer he got to the cross, the more he spoke of it. Uh, beginning with that scene in John chapter 12 with the arrival of the Greeks, he we go there, he suddenly changed course. All of a sudden, he said, now the hour has come. Now the hour has come. 
uh, has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. He went on to say, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. He who keeps his life, he, 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 he repeats this idea right there. Now he knows the cross is imminent. And he repeats this. He who loves his life loses it. He who hates his life in this world will keep it to life eternal. I discovered that this week. I've read that passage over and over again. I love it. And he repeats this idea right then. It's an echo of our passage. Well, in many ways, our entire passage is the anticipation of glory and Christ's exhortation and word and, and revelation to follow him as he makes his way back to the glory that is his from eternity. And that's intimated in the enigmatic promise of verse uh, 27. So Jesus concludes this discourse by declaring that there are some, some of those standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. There are different opinions on what he was referring to, but its placement immediately before the transfiguration suggests to me anyway, powerfully, that Peter, James, and John were the ones uh, standing there who saw the kingdom, who saw Christ in his glory. And all three synoptic gospels have that order. Right after this is the transfiguration. Have you verbalized your faith? Have you d declared your allegiance? Here is irony as we close. We often speak, people do, of the cost of following after Christ. He paid the price. You speak of cost, he paid the price. And the consequence of it is that those who follow him actually receive the payment. We, we receive the payment, and that's grace. Uh, that's the gospel of Christ. Let's close. Thank you, Lord, for what a wonderful Savior you are. Uh, what, uh, what a privilege to follow after you. We, we all confess together, I think, uh, that uh, we were often not very good followers, not very good uh, deniers, uh, don't like rejection, uh, don't show enough pride in our allegiance and, and relationship with you. And so we thank you that you're a forgiving God and you're also an empowering God. And we pray that you would ever more and more enable us uh, to follow more closely after your son till we one day find ourselves with him in his glory. It's in his name we pray, amen.